About a week ago, I asked my wife, hey, do we have any plans this weekend? And she said, yeah, we're going to movies with our friends. I replied, oh, we're going to see Oppenheimer? She said, no, we're seeing Barbie. And I was like, oh, okay. I have to admit, I did see the trailers for the film, but sometimes I have a really short attention span when it comes to commercials. And I sometimes see the same commercials over and over again, and I can never tell you what they're for. So I don't remember anything from the trailer for Barbie that talked about the plot other than Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie being in the film. And while personally I didn't find the movie very good, there were two highlights. Ryan Gosling is great in a comedic role, and I was also shocked to see Matchbox 20 featured prominently in the film with their song Push. Today we're going to talk about the history of the song, the controversy surrounding it, and how it ended up in the Barbie movie. Born on a U.S. Army base in Germany to a sergeant father and alcoholic mother, Matchbox 20's frontman Rob Thomas had a really rough childhood. His mom would take his older sister to live in Columbia, South Carolina, and Thomas would be shuttled off to rural South Carolina to hang out with his grandmother, who was also an alcoholic. His grandmother would run a general store where she also sold pot and moonshine under the counter, then there's his aunt Monkey who famously in 1975 hired serial killer Pee Wee Gaskins to kill her ex-boyfriend. She would go to prison for 30 years and soon started a relationship with Gaskins. By the time Thomas was 10, he would move back in with his sister and mother to a trailer park in Orlando. But his mom kept some pretty rough company partying and hanging out with bikers who would sometimes beat her up and she in turn would take out her anger on Rob. Parties were a pretty common sight at their home, with Thomas sometimes playing bartender. It wasn't uncommon for him to wake up the next morning and be surrounded by 10 or more bodies. His older sister Melissa, meanwhile, would end up running away from home at the age of 17 to be with her boyfriend. It was also around this time that Thomas's mother would be diagnosed with cancer. The doctors gave Thomas's mother six months to live. With him recalling to the LA Times, that aged me quickly. But his mother would end up beating the odds and pulling through her cancer ordeal. Amongst all the chaos in his family, Rob found music at a pretty young age, getting his first instrument at the age of 10, which was a Casio keyboard. His early years in South Carolina would convince him that he wanted to be a songwriter, taking cues from the old country greats before finally getting into Billy Joel, Elton John, The Cure, and Elvis Costello. He would recall to Rolling Stone how he was a nerd in school and soon started writing his own music in hopes of becoming one of the popular kids. Thomas would admit to the Huffington Post that sometimes for song ideas, he would create drama or get himself in bad situations, recalling, When I was young, I used to think I had to create drama around my personal life so I could write about it. A lot of the relationships and bad decisions of my early 20s was me subconsciously wanting to create the kind of environment that bleeds angry songs. I was also trying to get into horrible relationships that I knew would fall apart spectacularly. So once they did, I could write about them. By the early 90s, Thomas would eventually move back to Florida where he met several other like-minded musicians, including bassist Brian Yale and drummer Paul Doucette, who enlisted a few other musicians and they would form a band named Tabitha Secret. Doucette, Thomas, and Yale would end up leaving Tabitha Secret and started a new band called Matchbox 20 in 1995. They would end up also recruiting guitarist Adam Gaynor and Kyle Cook, and the band soon caught the attention of producer Matt Cerletic, who had a deal with Atlantic Records subsidiary Lava Records. The group's first album, Yourself or Someone Like You, would be inspired by Thomas's failed relationships and his terrible childhood. The album's breakout single, Push, would get noticed nearly a year after the album came out. The song would be written by Thomas while he was visiting New York City. Recalling to song facts, me and Matt Serletic came to meet with Jason Flom, head of Lava Records. We were staying at the Wellington. He bailed on us. He couldn't make the meeting. It was just us in the hotel room. We started playing songwriting exercises. Matt opened a book and said, point to a word, and then we'll start a song building around that word. He opened it up and I pointed at the word rusty. You think about Rusty, what if it had a bigger meaning? What if it was Rusty at life just in general? We wrote in that night, there's three things together. I've never been good enough, I'm a little bit rusty, and my head is caving in. There's imagery in there that sets up whatever you're trying to set up, he'd say. Released in 1996, Yourself or Someone Like You came out the same week as the band's label Lava Records folded. 
and the band started to worry that maybe they'd be dropped and started to think about their collective futures. But Atlantic Records noticed something strange. The group's album sales had spiked in Birmingham, Alabama, of all places, and the spike in sales was attributed to a local station, WRAX, who started playing the song Push. The band was soon absorbed by Atlantic Records, and the label issued Push as a single and shot a video for MTV. Soon enough, the song became a top five hit, and several singles followed in its footsteps, which also had chart success, including Real World, 3AM, and Back to Good. Push's lyrics dealt with a troubled relationship, but it also soon drew criticism from some feminist groups, with one group in New Hampshire calling for radio stations to boycott the song. The feminist groups claim that the song glorified domestic abuse, something Thomas pushed back against, putting out a statement at the time that says, the song isn't a call for physical violence, but rather an observations of the emotional battles a relationship goes through. And Thomas will claim that the relationship that inspired the song was one in which he was the one who was mistreated. Thomas would recall to the LA Times watching MTV News one day and seeing an ex-girlfriend of his being interviewed by the network, claiming to be the inspiration behind the song Push and threatening to sue Matchbox 20 for unpaid royalties. Luckily for him and his band, she wasn't serious and no lawsuit would be filed. In reality, the song was about a different high school girlfriend who broke up with Thomas by donating his possessions to Goodwill. With him recalling to the LA Times, I had no clothes, nothing. All the local bands got together and gave me their band t-shirts. For months, that's all I wore. Thomas would tell Entertainment Weekly in 1997, responding to the ongoing criticism of the song, saying, A former girlfriend of mine was an ingredient of the song, but other people have scarred me. I mean, I'm not going to pay my third grade librarian who gave me sh about now returning green eggs and ham. Getting to the Barbie movie, it seemed like the perfect timing given that Matchbox 20 are back this year with a new record and are out on tour, so you really couldn't ask for a better promotional opportunity considering the film could make upwards of a billion dollars. Push would be used by the movie's creators as the ultimate bro song. Push is used in two parts of the film. Barbie world in the beginning of the film is ruled by women, and the Kens are basically second fiddle to Barbie. The first scene showing the song Push would happen after Ken, played by Ryan Gosling, visits the human world, only to return to the Barbie world after discovering the patriarchy. Wanting to bring the patriarchy to the Barbie world and have men rule everything? Then there's a scene towards the end of the film where all the Kens serenade the Barbies with acoustic renditions of Push over and over again. The movie's director Greta Gerwig would tell USA Today about the song Push. Growing up, I loved that song. I was like, this is my rock and roll dad. Enjoy the who, but these are my guys. As for how Matchbox 20 frontman Rob Thomas felt about the movie asking to use Push, he told the same paper, I want to preface this by saying that I thought it was hilarious. But in Bring It On, Kristen Dunn's character has this douchey boyfriend, and there's a scene where he is in the dorm room with a Matchbox 20 poster in the background. There was a whole period during the 90s where the more successful we got, the bigger target we were. So I did this thinking I'd be the butt of the joke, and I was fine with that. I'm pretty thick-skinned. But Julie Greenwald from Atlantic Records came to the Hollywood Bowl a month or two ago. She had just seen the movie and was like, you come out of it loving Ken and loving Push. And I was like, ah, all right, really good. That concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in Rock Rolls Your Stories.